We're in a very interesting season here, and we've learned some of the hardest lessons as if there weren't more that we have needed to learn. And one thing I know that I knew when I came to Christ that I've known ever since, and that is in Christ, I have nothing to worry about. Every single thing is going to be ultimately brought around to clarity for me at some point, but we've really been in some learning situations again recently, and we feel that the reason is because we're moving into probably the season of our purpose and our calling, the, the why we are even um, here, why we were even called to um, to serve in this capacity. We feel that we are right on the edge of that and we're actually feeling very excited about what's coming. We don't know what it is, but we feel very excited about that. We know that we have really fought hard to stay the course and that it's been worth it. Every single thing has been worth it. And so I'm always trying to teach Basically, we see, we get so many calls, we meet with so many people, and a lot of the core issues seem to be the same. I mean, there's many circumstances, but a lot of what goes on in the middle ends up being the same exact teaching moments. And so I always try to make that a bigger teaching so that people can understand how this is all going on and I need help with this, but it points to a core problem or a core lie or a core something that's gone off track that if that were corrected, all of the other things would correct. So people get stuck out in the fruit and they lose sight of the root. And then the root just keeps growing more crazy fruit and throwing it around when they need to focus on the root of the problem and not the fruit. So I wanna address some common roots. And this is in believers. This is in Christians, people who um, are followers of Christ. So this would not apply to those who are not walking in genuine salvation. And so um, I want to speak to six very common problems that are in the course of that and I found I was reading this article that was written by her name is Victoria Realiano it's spelled R-I-O-L-L-A-N-O -L -L -O from I Believe and she nailed this down she wrote this so well that rather than reinvent a wheel that's already amazing I'm just going to use her um, her insight, so I'm going to use the, the court, the, her structure, and then I'm just going to add to that because she did such a fantastic job of putting this into, um, in teaching this. And so um, the title of her I Believe article is Six Things Satan Wants More Than Anything Else. And so whether we like it or not, if we are in Christ, there is a real enemy, the devil. And it's kind of shocking how many people want to argue that point, that he had a time in history, but it's not now. It is very clear who reads the Bible and who doesn't, because the Bible is very clear that the lashing of the devil is what we're going to experience now. The real wild, um, his his entrance into all things and making a mess of all things that's going on now so there's no chance that anybody can be a follower of christ doing things for the kingdom and not be constantly getting harassed at this point by the enemy because he's very much after those who are really making a difference and genesis 3 is where he first showed up regarding man and he has from the beginning known and been stated by God that he is nothing but evil. He's a liar, he's evil, and he has malicious intent for the man 
all of mankind. His enemy is God, and what he wants to destroy is the prize, which is us. In fact, Jesus in John 8.44 said he was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. In other words, there's no truth, no good, no love, and no hope that comes from the devil. So if you in any way have the door open to him, you can expect none of those things, at least not sustaining. You may have momentary illusions of them, but you will have no truth, no good, true good, no love, and no hope. And when we allow him to speak and have power over our lives through some kind of a trade that we have made, then we have this door open to him and we no longer get to decide how much of that he's going to take. Once that door is open because I want this, but I don't want, want all that, then you have given him permission to kill, steal, and destroy anything that is in your life. He has open season at the point that you say, I'm going to let him in this way. I just want him in this relationship. I don't want him in the rest. Well, we don't get to sort out on that plate what he'll take. But the six things that she listed, and I'll put um, a link to this in the, in the comments. The first is to make us doubt the word of God. The biggest trick he has, and he started with that. He came right out the gate with making Eve doubt the word of God in Genesis 3. And it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so he did this play on words, which confused the woman. It says she was deceived, but Adam sinned. So that's why Adam knew what he was doing. She was confused by the enemy. So it says she was deceived, Adam sinned. And as for humans, our view of life is very limited. And what we need to understand is God is looking at our life from eternity's vantage point, not from the day we're born till the day we die. God is not looking at that. He is timeless in how he looks at us. So we were with him prior to this earth experience. And post-earth experience, we will go into eternity with him or without him based on what we do with Jesus here. And so when God is looking at all these different things that we're facing that we're wanting worked out, he's looking at this from a eternal, not this brief wisp of time. He is trying to accomplish great things in our lives because he's looking at forever. And he wants us to grow and turn into the best version of what he can create for us for eternity, not for this life. He's not trying to, um, uh, all of our prayers that are, which I think we're all guilty of, where we want relief in this moment. He's actually looking to build deep character, um, great, great character and perseverance. So we have to know that God isn't against us. He's looking at a much longer frame of time. And if he answered every prayer with yes, that seemed like he should, healing and all the ways we interpret healing, we may never grow into the maturity that he would want us to. Therefore, we may miss eternity completely because we stayed self-focused. We had a sugar daddy concept of God that when I want something, I go to my father and he gives it to me because faith tells me I can say it and get it. That does nothing for the plan of God, which is eternal. It is an eternal plan he has for each one of us. And he's 
He's trying to build us into someone far past what we are experiencing here in this life. We look at our life as, I want this, I need this, and I want this now. And he is looking at that short-sighted, immature character defect of ours, and he is needing to push out way past that to accomplish his purposes. And a lot of times the only way to get us to let go is great suffering. That's the only way. Mountaintops, we get so... Um, we, when we're on riding on mountaintops and everything is handed to us, the character that is produced in that is so pathetically self-centered and not caring. And there's very few people that amount to anything of quality character or of value to their fellow man who had just an amazing life with no hardship. So when fighting unbelief, which I have had certainly my experience with I think all of us have these weaknesses my faith often is shipwrecked by past losses patterns of losses trauma bad outcomes so if my experience always was if this thing happens it's always going to end up over here then I have faith in that outcome and not in the character and the plan of God for my life. So I'm looking at, I can't go through this again. I can't do this anymore. I, I don't think I can get through that again. So I'm now looking at circumstances and not looking at the character and the plan of God for my life. I'm stuck in this thing where I've been through that before. I don't want to go through that again. Where God is like... Okay, so I'm really not stuck in the details here. I'm trying to build you into something. Where in eternity, he plans a restoration of, for eternal purposes of the desires of our heart. So many things that we value here either aren't of eternal value, or if they are, we will be shocked and amazed at what we are granted on the other side of eternity. But God is very focused on changing us on the inside. He wants to develop patience. He wants us to be able to endure. And spiritual strength is very much needed for what's coming. And I don't watch the news much, but just the little bit that I watch, it's, it's kind of um, mind-boggling to watch how fast things are coming into position where... I believe the apostasy is in full, it's in a full roaring progression right now. The apostasy where the believers are falling away, they are falling away. I'm not going to get into details of how that looks, but when I'm just going to say that when I look at the conversations I have with people and it's completely fixated on the politics of the country and not on the lost and the dying, if you watch the statistics of what fentanyl has done to our country, they say it's increasing the deaths by 50% every year and the statistics of being able to get free from fentanyl are very slim. So this is increasing by 50 percent every year and very few people are getting free many are dying but we've got people absolutely stuck in yuck on what they want to have happen in the politics of our country and i'm not against god ruling and reigning through that but when we have soul winners the evangelists all the the gifted people in the body of Christ completely obsessed with everything but the lost and dying, the message of the cross, out here sharing in this mission field that is absolutely a bloodbath anymore. There's no people out here hardly. There's just, when I'm trying to help people go to the next person, there's just this few group of people and we all know who they are. This is a big metro area, but so many have gotten caught up in things that are far 
removed from this immediate mission field that they are a part of and we need more people we need people to go what does God have what does he want me to do with my life and start serving here because you're desperately needed and that's what's so frustrating about focus is that people can get so off on they miss they read the word but they miss the point of the word and God's character and plan for us is that we are out here representing Jesus Christ that we are standing for the cross that we are telling people how to get saved many of them are dying they're not going to get free of this drug but we should be bringing salvation and the Holy Spirit to them as fast as we can because that's the only hope they have of living the only hope they have of living so that's the mission field not arguing about other things God says to us look at me I am your maker I am for you I will get you through the hard things and you're going to be ready for what's ahead but there's no other way than through through toddy and i were just down at in the city today and we were we pulled into a subway on the way home and it it was a rough crowd it was a pretty rough crowd but we both are so entranced by our mission field we I mean they so enjoyed visiting like people just stand in this long line in a subway and and it was just like a social encounter it was a social encounter and it was everybody was vastly different than us but I just really enjoy having been chosen and given the great privilege to love those in the inner city because they're some of the most amazing fascinating people I know and if you for the most part don't position yourself as different and of a different species than them it can be a pretty enjoyable experience and that's what we enjoy doing I mean this is just a common thing that we get to do and we're just grateful for it because we have been given a lot of privileges that we don't take for granted because we haven't always had them but we see a lot of other people that don't have any of them they have zero privileges and they're just in this place they really have nowhere safe to go and I just think about that because that used to be my life I had no safe place to go who do you even call I mean nobody's safe and so I just really marvel at having gotten through and then having no fear like I have no fear of that because if I wasn't afraid back then to keep going out in that why would I suddenly now think well that's too dangerous I don't want to be out there I mean you have to use wisdom but we also need to be Jesus because he gave up everything for every one of those people and we should never take for granted our freedom from addiction from um, poverty from um, just safety in general we should be doing everything we can to add some kind of blessing to their life and when people instead dwell on their own life and their own disappointments and their own just immediate circle and what's not going right and my church isn't going the way I want it and I'm not getting this at work and we just stay fixated on this tiny little picture of our life then we miss out on all the things that God really intended to do with us had we given him the freedom to do that we don't really grow in faith because our faith is focused on these list of things that matter to me strength same focused on this little list of things that matter to me that are my my things and intimacy with God that grows through adversity adversity and suffering is how God had Jesus grow and it's exactly the same for us and this isn't suffering just as a 
because we messed up our life so bad, like some of us, even though he does use that to a great deal. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And I would say at my age, at this point, I wouldn't trade anything. There is not one experience, even the worst of them, that I would trade because of what it taught me and the, the door it has given me into other people's lives that they're kind of surprised by, actually, because I was so brought back to sanity and um, sober living after things that I knew there was no way I was going to have my mind back. There was no way. I could not live with the memory of some of the things that I experienced, but yet I am. I am living it and I can talk about it and I can tell people I know the pain of certain things but Satan he has a way of convincing people to doubt God's Word just in detail and in grand scheme so in the details of I think mostly of like idolatry um, and just certain sins so God has called us to love himself more than anything else he is he is first or he is nothing there isn't an option for him to be second he's either first or he's out and so people there's obviously a great range of struggle in that but God is either first or he's out and you can call it whatever you want, but there's no option for you to put something ahead of him. It's called idolatry and it's abandoning him. So you say, God will never leave me. No, he won't, but you can definitely leave him and you're lost. So when you put something in front of God, you are lost if you keep it there. So many times that's people people put people in front of god so they'll abandon their call they'll abandon their mission they'll abandon the the great center of their relationship with god because of a person i've done that but god made me so miserable i was absolutely devastated in the process that it it stopped because i wasn't going to be able to live I was brought, brought right back to the same despair very quickly. That's what God does. He allows that relationship. If we're genuinely his, we know we're cheating on God and we're either going to continue and our heart will get hard and cold and we will not be his apostasy or our heart will break over what we've done to him and we will run from our idol and we will fall on our face for mercy from God and so when the enemy gives everybody the ability to go to a different preacher on TV YouTube church whatever that avoids the tough truth that you can't have anything in front of God you can't there's no option to do that in a marriage we don't allow it why would God have to put up with that but many get this this idea that you can have God and what and whatever your pleasure you can have both but you cannot and many have become skeptics because they hear so many different voices they hear this voice say ah oh, she's so rigid she's very legalistic all that but read the Bible don't go to me someone else read the Bible second Peter 2 read second Peter chapter 2 read that that will help you I am not telling anybody to believe me I'm telling you believe the Bible so if we doubt even one word that God has spoken then we're gonna start to walk in that we're gonna start to second guess and and minimize and we're gonna if we can do it with one thing we can do it with another and then we're gonna end up like Eve because Eve she walked with God in the garden. She knew him. She physically was present with God. And yet the devil came to her in a beautiful form, not as a snake. And he, he tricked her. He messed with her words. He made her...
crazy in the head over what he was saying. She couldn't tell the truth and she disobeyed quickly, which is what most do. This isn't a long fall many times. It is a dangle this beautiful thing in front of us and we're just so captivated that we just start. <sighs> we must always remember God does not lie. He means every word he said. He will hold us accountable to the Bible. We all have them. It's right here. Read it because the truth is in there. Numbers 23, 19 said, God is not human that he should lie. He's not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? So the idea that culture has changed the word of God, absolutely not. If we think for a second that uh, all the different things I hear people say, well, that was back then. I promise you, this is a living, active book. It's the bread of life. If you read it, it's going to convict you and you're going to know the truth. If you don't want to read it because you don't want to know the truth, then you can meet him and you can explain why you think you should still be allowed into heaven when you refused to listen to the one who would clarify all the confusion. Another, the second thing that she lists that the enemy loves to do is to paralyze you with fear. And that is definitely my battle. I could talk for days on the impact of fear in my life and, and even recent. I mean, fear is a very recent problem that I've had. Fear can grab my focus faster than just about anything because, again, it goes back to all the trauma, all the things, all the things, all the things. But what it does is it doesn't allow you to focus on God, who he is, what he says, and all the times that he has brought me out. So if our lives are consumed with fear, then it becomes, well, what if this? What if that? What if this happens? And what if that happens? And life becomes focused on what I call script writing. We start writing out, well, this is going to end up here and that's going to go there. And then they're going to say this and then they're going to do that. Based on all of our other experiences, we're just going to look at all these things and say, I already know where this is going. Where God says, I can so suddenly flip the script but we're so fixated in our mind on, I already know the script. I already know where this is going. And fear will keep us from taking the step, the simple step that says, I'm going to trust God on this. I'm going to trust God and I'm going to believe for him to flip the script. I'm finally getting to that. <laughs> I'm finally learning some of that. So I feel for everybody who's in that because it's taken me a long time. I've been one of great anxiety. Fear of man has been a crippling problem for me. And God is clear. He does not give us fear. Instead, his word brings peace, wisdom, love, and a sound mind. So again, we have audio Bibles playing all over. I don't know how to live without them because if I did not have that constantly going into my mind, you don't even want to know where this would all end up. I already know where it all would end up. John, First John fourteen eighteen says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And so I would say over the last five years, I've had one of the larger battles with fear that I've ever had because I became fearful of man. And what man could do to me is what I became fearful of, not what God can do with me, but what man can do to me is basically where I got my wires crossed. And it was supported by facts. There was a lot of facts that led to my conclusion of what man can do to me. And because that all tapped into previous Things, I had this arsenal of previous experiences that added all this energy to that. It was crippling to my life. And many along the way, I mean, God literally guided my life by um, having people speak words to me to keep me going because 
I could not hear or, or see for a while. I mean, it was, I just wanted to shut down half the time just to cope, but people would literally guide my life. And of course, then he sends me an intercessor, which was incredible. But so God took care of me through all of that, recognizing that I had been knocked completely down. Oddly, this, it was about two weeks ago. So this has been going on since it started in March of 2017, actually. So this has been going on that long. But so I've had all these wonderful people around me helping me. And I've been able to see with great clarity. But a man from um, Kansas City called me about two weeks ago, I think, three weeks ago, regarding his son. He had been given our name by someone in Missouri. And so he was asking me um, the circumstances surrounding his son. He was asking me for coaching on how, what do we do as parents? How do we, how do we move through this great storm that this young man was in? And then he stops in the middle of it and he said I have a word for you and I'm thinking wow I didn't see this happening but he said God is telling me that you have put a stake in the ground that will serve to redefine the territory to raise my voice and to call back what has been stolen he said, if the enemy has stolen a child, you demand that he return it. Start praying like a bride and not a widow. Shoot higher. And then he said, and this verse is for you, Isaiah 57, 50 verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be ashamed. And I'm telling you that verse was the first thing that came all the way through, all the way through, not stuck and filtered through all the crazy going on. It came all the way through. And I thought, how crazy that he says this right now when he's asking me for help with his child. And it totally changed how I was able to speak to him because I was able to operate from a position of the devil is stealing his son. No, absolutely not. And I have processed this. I actually printed that verse out in like a big piece of paper and hung it on my bathroom mirror so that I can look at it all the time. But I look at this and I think, you know what? I have put a stake in the ground. I know exactly what hill I've chosen to die on. I am amazed that I have still kept that same stake in the same hole that I jammed it in to begin with. And I am still going to raise my voice. And I am going to call back what has been stolen. And I love that God has once again done every possible thing, many, many things to say, this fear is leaving. <laughs> it's going away. I'm not going to leave you strapped underneath this thing because I hated it. I hate it. So I know that God is the reason I'm free of fear because he is the reason I'm free of anything. He's always the reason that I get free of anything. It's him because I cannot do it myself. So without him and this, I honestly don't know for people. Her third thing the devil really wants is to silence us from sharing the gospel or to share a false gospel. I would say as dangerous as not sharing the gospel is sharing a wrong version of the gospel. A version that you feel will always be received, that will always come as good news. It's not of abandoning sin and self-living, living for self, if it does not require that sin be stopped, you are selling a false gospel and hell is filling up with people who believe you 
because they kept their sin and felt they were saved, we meet them all the time. We meet them all the time. They're positive they're saved. They don't have any issue with that. They're buried in sin. They're sinning all the time and their life is completely tore up by their sin. But they weren't told that they had to leave their sin. They were just told to ask Jesus into their heart and there's no other requirement. Well, that's not the gospel. That is completely a false gospel. So make sure you're sell telling them the right gospel because the, the sad thing is, is if you're telling them a false gospel, the price at the end for you doing that for yourself is going to be so terrible because you're betraying Jesus, you're betraying the cross, you're betraying God the Creator, you're betraying all of them. There is no chance you yourself will be saved if you're sharing a message that is not the biblical gospel. Make sure you get it right. A recent statistic claims that less than 1% of those who claim to be Christian actually care enough to even make it a priority to share the gospel. So if you compare this to a marriage as God does, how would you feel if your spouse place the same priority on caring for you and any children in the home, making sure you have your needs met, a home, food, just clothing, what you needed, as you place on caring for Jesus and those around you, knowing that Jesus is their only way into heaven. So how well do you think your serving of Jesus in this thing he calls a marriage and others which is your entire purpose with Jesus how does if your spouse gave as much focus to you as you give to that how would you feel about them that's what we need to look at a Christian who hoards the gospel to themselves is at best an ineffective Christian most likely not one at all. One of our primary roles as a follower of Christ is to make disciples for Christ. It's, a, it's an expectation. Matthew 28, 19, it makes it our mission. It's, it's, Jesus said it. It was the last thing he said. Yet the enemy works, especially in this country, to silence Christians. Social media has turned into such a war zone that many people are too nervous to even share God's word because they don't want to be attacked or associated with a church they're not sure is even truthful. But at the same time, none of that matters. That's not the filter through which we will be evaluated when we meet Jesus. This has it all. It's very clear that we're to be sharing Jesus and bringing others into his kingdom. And although we cannot give the enemy all the blame for this, we can see that most Christians have adopted what they feel is the right to have a quiet experience as a Christian. They don't want to offend anyone. They don't like offending anyone. There's too many people offending everyone. But followers of Christ, which is what is a genuine Christian, you either, you can't, a Christian is a name only unless you're a follower of Jesus Christ. A real Christian is a follower of Jesus Christ. That means you do what he does. If you don't, you're not a Christian. You're just a label of a religion. We are to be using our lives to further the gospel. If we're a genuine follower, disciple of Jesus Christ, our life purpose is to further the gospel. It doesn't matter if you work at McDonald's. It doesn't matter if you are a homemaker. It doesn't matter where you are. Your life purpose is to further the gospel. I used to, um, a pastor that I, he's, he's now passed on, but he would talk about um, women that were former congregants of his church who he would go visit in the rest home and this is back in the phone book days he said they would sit on their beds they could no longer walk but they had a phone and they would call down the phone list they would just call people and invite them to church they would just call randomly people and invite them to church they're in a rest home. They can't even move around. 
but they still continued to serve and try to reach people for Christ. That's someone who gets it. Jesus was murdered for our sin, every one of us. All of our sin, the only way it can be paid for it was the death of Jesus. It gives us the freedom to tell of our restoration to God. And his murder was, it could not have been more public and more shameful and more terrible. He endured all of it in the wide open in front of everyone. And for us to think that our Savior, our only chance at heaven, who was naked, beaten, and hanged in public, is going to sanction for us to keep our private beliefs private, because we don't want to be misunderstood, we don't want to be rejected. If we think for a second that's going to fly when we meet God, we're not even going to have a defense. There will not even be anything that comes from us because we'll be standing in front of the one who has holes in his hands, holes in his feet, who publicly endured all of our shame, all of our ridicule, and we're saying, I don't want to do any of that for him in return. I wouldn't be one of those people if I were anyone. Because if someone hadn't dared to share Christ boldly with me when I was in straight psychosis, like nuts out of my mind, 12 pastors said, no, you go to the hospital. We'll come see you when you're like right in the head. But one dared to just feverishly share the gospel with me. And you know what? It got through. It got through because the word does that. It isn't about the condition of the person. It's about the power of the gospel. That's what kept me out of hell because I was going to die within a couple of days if someone hadn't done that. So here I am. I'm pretty serious about this message because I should have been in hell 30 years now except that someone knew the power of the gospel. They believed the Bible, and they thought, she's not dead, I'm going to see if I can bring her to Christ. I was just ridiculously offensive in my lifestyle. But here I am, passionately chasing Jesus still, because I know I don't deserve to be saved. I deserve nothing from Jesus. But I am so incredibly amazed by him that he picked someone like me and said, carry this message forward. I will do it until I die. I am so honored. So if we aren't being an influencer for Jesus Christ, I guarantee that you're being an influencer for the enemy. You're on the wrong mission field. You're serving the wrong side. Do not be ashamed of sharing the gospel because Jesus was not ashamed to be publicly murdered for you. It says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Number four, she lists, is to cause you to live in shame. <laughs> There's so much of this in the culture that we work in, but I think in every culture, people are either brazen or they're full of shame or they're both. They can have all this going on. There seems to be little gray. And fortunately, the best thing that happened to me, I was arrested the night that I was um, miraculously saved. But I remember just begging God that that would not get in the newspaper because it was going to be so embarrassing for me. You know what's the best thing he did for me? He let it get in the newspaper. He let it become part of the news. As I'm a brand new Christian, and here it is out there, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because now uh, my secrets aren't secrets. I can't run around and act like I, I don't have them because now, I mean, everybody knew. And so it ended up kind of knocking down that shame, pride, all that that was all in the way of me what little bit was left of it after that my sins were written up in a public newspaper and then people tell even more crazy stories about that which may or may not be true I don't have any idea what stories are even true about me because I was frankly too intoxicated or high most of the time to know but I tell people, if you really want to know the truth about me, I mean, you can hear things and come to me and say you heard these things about me. 
But if you want to know some things about me, you just come to me because I have crazier things to say than anything you can hear from anyone else. So the best thing God did was to knock that shame right out because he actually took my shame to the cross. So if I hang on to that shame, I'm saying, I want this. I'm not going to lay this at the foot of the cross because I deserve it. Jesus was murdered for my shame, but I think I deserve to pay for my own shame. So I'm going to hang on to it, which is really a foolish thing to do. So reminding us of our past sins, our current sins, our insecurities, is a very major role of the devil. Because if he can keep us thinking that we are somehow tied to or identified by or our value is connected to the things about ourselves that we have trouble accepting, then he can effectively disqualify us from the race and cut off the love of God and the grace of God. And we will never even be able to receive the word of God because we've already cut it off right at the cross. We've cut it off. And in this choice that we have made to separate what we can and cannot receive where Jesus said I came to the cross I laid down my life for you you got to you laid it yours down for me don't keep the shame of all the things don't grab that shame off the ground and say oh but I'm going to keep that part throw it all down because you will remain very defeated frustrated and separated from God if you do because nothing good can come through if you do Shame is going to keep us focused on ourselves, self-obsessed, self-obsessed, self-obsessed. And you're going to make your value, your worth. The whole point of Jesus coming was for you, for me. But the shame will tell us we, we're not good enough for that. If he really, if people knew, well, guess what? People, they have their own. So the devil simply wants us focused on what we did somehow back there but get in your small group confess what you did back there and move on get past it the truth is none of us deserve Jesus none of us deserve to speak for him none of us deserve to be an ambassador for Christ on this earth none of us we're ridiculous to think we deserve anything from Jesus but yet Jesus gave up heaven for us he gave up everything for us he gave up his life for us that's the truth don't let shame stop you from jesus if the devil can keep you self-absorbed you won't be able to walk in what god has for you you're going to be identified by your past behaviors at least in your own mind even if people don't know you're still hanging on to that low self-esteem is still pride it's self-obsession and when we make a choice instead to turn away from self to Christ and put our identity in him, there is a, a freedom that comes from that that is, it's, it's hard to even put words to because most of us that know who we really are, we're very happy to throw all that down. But to be able to walk as an ambassador and a voice for the King of Kings, who deserves that? Who deserves that? But yet he extends that to us. And most people are he too embarrassed. They're too embarrassed to stoop that low to be a voice for the king. Don't be one of them. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You won't know until you do it how freeing that really is. Romans 8 1 says there is now no, no there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit throw the flesh off the fifth one is for you to worship an idol other than Jesus and remember the first commandment is I will love God God is going to be the top the first the all he is top or out so most people, believe it or not, they call themselves Christians. They may, may even say they're born again. They had some kind of experience. But their true God is their feelings. Self-gratification, pleasure, their feelings 
fixing their feelings and making their feelings okay is their true religion. It isn't, what does Jesus want me to do right now? I'm going to go do that. It isn't that at all. So if that's not what you do, but you are listening to your feelings and pleasure and what you love and what you like and your, your things are what you do, your true religion is called hedonism. H-E-D-O-N-I-S-M. Most people who claim to be Christian in America are truly hedonists by definition, and they will be exposed that way on Judgment Day. Hedonism is the religion that they follow, not Christianity. And nothing is going to cause as many to turn away from heaven as the pursuit of relationships. People are constantly dating apps, pursuing relationships, pursuing they know they shouldn't be in half these relationships, but I don't see anything create the wreckage in human life and to the kingdom as relationships. Because of the massive amount of feelings involved with that, people will, he tells us to walk by faith and not by sight. That's what God commands. Pursuing relationships is a refusal and doing the flip opposite of that. Walking by sight and not by faith. That's what that is. So when you pursue the people around you over the God who created you and who will judge you on the last day and who loves you more than anything else, even more than anything, but you are chasing people over him, you're walking by sight sight and not by faith and that is against God so if there's something that costs the kingdom more I I have watched all levels of human behavior debauchery and choices pursuit of relationships is what train wrecks most people and takes them out of kingdom work and takes them out of the kingdom completely they abandon God for a relationship they had him but they left him Again, he won't leave you, but you can leave him, and many do. He says the road is narrow and few there be that find it because many run off after a person. We're to be an extension of Jesus on this earth, an extension of Jesus Christ, not an extension of some other person. He called us to be an ambassador for him, and that shows up in everything we do and say. We don't become playgrounds. Our bodies are not playgrounds. If your body is a playground for someone else, other than the spouse that you're married to, rightfully so, you are not a follower of Christ. Therefore, you are not in the kingdom. An idol is anything that we place before, the, before Jesus. And in the Old Testament, this was like objects, literal objects. And although most people today, they don't have a golden calf or a statue, even a religious statue that they praise and worship. Idols are what has taken first place in your heart. So I obviously serve a large community of people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. Um, the, the addictions that really mess up your life. And I tell us, our people, a lot that we are the most fortunate of all. Our idolatry is so wicked and destructive that we are forced to our face, <laughs> literally, many times. It doesn't allow us peace. It makes us completely crazy. It wrecks our bodies. It wrecks our minds. It wrecks everything about our lives. It wrecks our relationships, even our sinful ones. It wrecks those. It wrecks everything. Addicts come to Christ probably in greater numbers than any other people group because we absolutely are forced into desperation by our idol. However, equally as sinful, food, religion, money, the love of money, not money, the love of money, power, hate, hate of just certain people groups offense, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, people have so many 
lists of things that they serve and you'll find out what it is when you say we want to go and do this thing we want to go to our let's say our sibling who is dying we want to share Christ with them will you come with us we have maybe the next six hours to reach them we know where they are you'll start hearing all the excuses you'll start hearing all the things that come up all the reasons why people don't go share Christ with the ones that are dying and I promise you there's people dying all around all of us all of us have those people but the reason you don't go points to your priority that is not Jesus it is not the kingdom and it is not saving people from hell it is your idol and most of them will allow you to go into the years into your life without crippling you in any way that will force you to repent and look at Jesus like minded like a lot of people around me who are addicted to drugs and alcohol we were forced to reckon with I probably am going to hell today what am I going to do many worship sports you see they won't miss a single sports anything about a certain thing very very committed to it God knows that we have that ability he knows how fervent how dedicated how passionate he knows that he made us and he sees our price he sees our idol he knows what fires us up and gets us excited to where we'll just drop everything on a big fat ticket a lot of money to go there he knows what it is a political figure we see that today for various reasons people are polarized by political figures and if I would challenge anyone and I'm not even on a side of all that I just think make sure that you're sharing Christ that you're promoting the kingdom of heaven more than you are caught in that battle whatever battle it is you're caught in make sure that your building of the eternal kingdom has the most of your focus otherwise you are way off spending hours on social media which you can do if you're using it for ministry I will not argue that the social media is an excellent platform but I'm talking trolling people trolling YouTube trolling Facebook all the trolling that people do to just spy on everyone that is a complete waste of life Netflix shows dating apps religious activities people who just do 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 get out and get caught in the religious there's so many people out in religious activities but when we are trying to call people into the center of this war zone to bring salvation you won't see those people coming around they want to be where the Holy Spirit is is or they feel the Holy Spirit is causing people to jump and do all kinds of exciting things but the mission field is where people are needed and we're having a hard time finding people I've been out here um, we've been on our own in ministry now for four years and this is the smallest we've ever been because everybody is just basically abandoned ship they don't want the ministry life they don't want the hard work of really reaching people for Christ I mean you can pour into people and try to develop them into being missionaries but it really there aren't very many people interested in doing that life offers too many stimulating options for them and they prefer to go that way and most do I mean in our experience um, to live a life that's extremely focused on self that's what they want and self even in the form of religion we can spend years worshiping things that seem good they seem godly but then if somebody takes it away if you lose your ministry position if you lose your your ministry group who are you are you still just as passionate about the mission do you just take it down a block and fire it up there you need to examine who are you without all the busyness that goes on don't make more time for 
the gym unless, well, I'm just saying that can be a mission field too, but life's pleasures, make sure that Jesus has the best of your life, your time and your resources. Because before long, we can start to look at all of the things more than we look at God. And that's when it gets dangerous because our eyes are on everything except today he would have had you go do this. Today he would have had you go speak to this person. Today he would have asked you to go do this. But you're so distant from him that you're not even hearing the voice. You have no idea what he would have you do today because you're completely removed from intimacy with him which is required for heaven so god wants us to have good things but he doesn't want them taking priority over his things we must be willing to lay down whatever he leads us to if it becomes something that now gets in the way of himself and what he wants from us exodus 23 through 6 says you shall have no other gods before me you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who he says hate him because they have something in front of him and they know how much it hurts him. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Number six, the devil wants us to be deceived. And it has never been more important right now for us to stand out in the world because it's getting darker, but it's so confusing and people think they're in the faith and they're not. The Bible is the truth. And in today's everything around us we see so many accommodating they build the word to fit around this lifestyle that they want instead of building a lifestyle around the word it's backwards and this is definitely the work of satan he takes those who they feel they're christian they maybe came into like in luke it talks about the sowing of the seed and that it actually sprouted but look at the fruit. Always look at the fruit they're bearing and you will be able to see. If they're bearing good fruit that is eternal, people being discipled into eternity and creating disciples, that's good fruit. There's no other fruit that's really important to God. There is nothing else that is a plan B other than building the kingdom of heaven. There's many different ways he calls people to do that, but make sure that you're doing that the way he's called you to. Instead of seeking a life that follows the Holy Spirit, many look to their own flesh and they go by, well, I feel this, or I feel like this, or I feel this. And they develop a standard of truth that fits the feelings that they have about what they prefer, what they would like. And this is exactly what Eve did. It's exactly what Eve did in the garden. And instead of looking at the word, again, read Second Peter chapter 2. Instead of doing what the word says, they do what they want the word to say. And then the enemy keeps them lukewarm, hypocritical, and then many don't even want to follow Christ because of them. There's going to be a price to pay for that. We have to remember that Satan will do anything to cause confusion. And he wants to make God look like a hard master, a very hard um, task focused. But when you as a parent in your home have children and your children tell you, guess what? I'm going to run my own life. They're six and they're telling you, you don't get to tell me what to do anymore. I'm going to do what I like to do. I'm going to be who I want to be. I'm going to tell you how this is going to go. You would say, no, that's not how this goes in this house. I'm the parent. You're going to line up. But yet we would accuse God of being hard and wicked and mean for doing the same thing, for being a good 
parent. He's the only chance we have of turning out in even 1% decent. We need to not ever give the enemy any power over our minds and our actions. We are to fully walk in the word of God only. Only the word of God. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but they will have itching ears and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And we're out in a field where we're pretty entrenched in where the gospel is being shared and not shared. So we know that people choose who they will listen to. We know that they will label certain people who do tell the truth. We know that people listen to who they want to listen to. God knows that. People can see who you follow. I would say if there was any time in history when you would want to have this right, there's going to be a soon day a soon day when everyone in the world is going to realize, whoa, I just missed it. I missed it. I waited one more day, one more day, one more day, one more day, like most people are doing. And then all of a sudden, there wasn't one more day. But the problem is, is there's a lot of people who are hanging on for one more day, one more day. I just need enough drugs for one more day, one more day. I don't want to go to hell today. I was one of those people. I don't want to go to hell today. I know I'm going to hell, but I don't want to go today. I need just enough to get through for today. I hear people say that all the time. I just need enough for today. Well, that is factual. We just need enough for today. But the thing is, there's hardly anyone out there that even cares about them. People have quit. They, they talk about all the things wrong with them. You don't want to enable them. You don't want to this. You don't want to that. Well, why don't you bring the Holy Spirit to them? Why don't you bring them the offer for prayer? Why don't you just invite them into a coffee shop and feed them and sit and listen to them? That's all you have to do. This isn't like some big thing that you have to bring. You just, they've maybe only got today. So don't wait one more day for yourself and don't wait one more day for them. Because all of our opportunities that we chose to say, no, I don't want to do that today, are going to come up before us on Judgment Day. They're all going to be there. We're going to get to see every single thing that we omitted, not just committed, omitted. Every single opportunity that God had for us that we said, I don't hear him or I don't want to hear him or I just don't want to do that. All of it is being recorded. Don't waste your life. That's what I decided. I have formerly been in places where I knew I was wasting my life. God has given me so much and most of it in the form of life, breath, the ability to speak and not talk crazy talk all day. He has given me the ability to see people, to see suffering and to see that person needs somebody to simply greet them today. That's I don't have really any extravagant anything beyond that. I thrive in going to the one that is not seen by anyone else, that has lost sight of being important or valuable, mattering to anyone. That's my mission field. Because I was that person. There was no one. Nobody cared when it came to the end. And most of the people that I'm around feel the same way. They were in a position where everybody was done. But God wasn't done. So I would urge you to not waste your life. Time is very short. You're going to want to get your purpose and your mission squared up before you meet him. There are expectations. If Jesus was murdered for you, I'm, I promise you, there are expectations of your life for him. And you definitely want to know what they are. And you definitely don't want those you love the most, the ones that you're spending all your days with, going to hell because they didn't have a clear message of what was required of them to go to heaven. Don't ever make you needing approval from man, needing to be liked, not wanting 
resistance, not wanting to um, be rejected. Don't ever make that the reason that you don't step in front of someone that's being pushed fast by the devil into an eternity in a lake of fire. Don't make that your reason to say, I just don't want to do that today. Precious Lord, all of us don't deserve to be here today. And many people didn't wake up this morning. And many people died today when they didn't really want to die today. I ask that everybody that ever hears this will get a jolt right now that they are not deserving of this life. They are not owed all the blessings that they have. Every single thing we have, including our very breath right now, is a gift. And many people won't have it, and one day we won't either. Help us to not waste our life in light of eternity. Help us to take very seriously one more day, one more day, one more day. Help us to not waste our time. You never wasted anything, and you certainly don't waste us. So help us to take you seriously, Jesus. I thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ that covers every single mind that hears me and that they would have all of the voices stopped, all the voices, the distractions and the enemy stopped, and that they would hear your voice right now speak to them, that only your voice would come through right now, God, and you would either show them visually or speak to them and tell them what is it that you require of them. I ask that you bring everyone to a choice. Are they going to live for self? Are they going to live for you? And I ask that you cut through all the deception right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, fill every single person. I ask that you overwhelm every single person right now with truth. And I thank you for being so amazing to those of us who know we don't deserve you. And I ask for many miracles to happen. In Jesus' name, amen.